very honored to have with us the candidates for the Director General of the World Health Organization. The um, position of Director General of the World Health Organization, as you know, is a very complex position. In addition to having to deal with communicable diseases such as outbreaks, uh, the recent Ebola outbreak, a good example, and non-communicable diseases and issues such as smoking and all these risk factors which play into the non-communicable diseases, the Director General has to deal with issues related to intellectual property and with universal health coverage and many, many more. And these issues must be dealt with in a very complex environment. A complex environment which includes work with industry, work with NGOs, work with academics, work with others, by and at the same time avoiding undue influence from them while working in close partnerships with governments who might have a diverse range of ideas. At the same time, the Director General works in an organization which is decentralized with six regional directors, and those regional directors are elected by a subgroup of the collective group of Ministers of Health that actually elect the Director General. So a very complex area in which the Director General must work. And so as I was coming in today, I was thinking this is really a job for someone who's a jack of all trades, but at the same time, a leader in one. So the jack of all trades is clear, technical understanding, political understanding, a whole series of things that are necessary. But at the same time, the Director General must be a leader with a vision and not only use that vision in preparing for the Director Generalship, but also in bringing others along with that vision. So a very complex job, a very complex job description, and we're very pleased that our six, well, five candidates are here. And um, we just, again, like to welcome you to Chatham House, and thank you for coming. My name is Surya Moon. I'm the Director of Research of the Global Health Center uh, at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. I'm very honored to be here as the co-chair of this event um, and to be representing the Global Health Center and, and our director, um, Ilona Kickbush. I wanted to thank our partners here at Chatham House for uh, hosting and organizing this event, uh, the audience in the room and online who will be really driving the content, particularly in the second half of the afternoon. Uh, I also wanted to thank the Wellcome Trust for providing support for this event, as well as the Rockefeller Foundation, which is supporting this event and also a larger project uh, of the Global Health Center, of which this is a, a part. Um, we will be, in fact, organizing a follow-up debate on March 6, 2017, in Geneva for the three candidates who are advanced by the WHO Executive Board um, in January, and that debate will also be webcast to facilitate the broadest possible public participation. Uh, as you can see, there's unprecedented uh, public interest in the DG election, and that's reflected in the packed house here at Chatham House and the heavy traffic that I understand is already active online. Uh, so what I would finally like to do is also thank all of the candidates for being here and the, for your willingness to openly engage with the public in a way that is quite unprecedented uh, in this election process. So I wanted to offer um, in the remaining three or four minutes just a few thoughts on why the next DG of the WHO matters. Why is this so important? And because my family and I recently moved from uh, the United States to Geneva, it's got me thinking a lot about transatlantic journeys and how uh, a few hundred, a hundred years ago, in fact, everybody used to make that journey by ship. And uh, a ship, a big ocean-going ship, is in fact a pretty good metaphor for WHO in many ways. And it raises three questions, which is, what is the state of the ship today? Um, what do we need from that ship, and in particular, the captain of the ship? And finally, on what kinds of waters is the ship currently sailing? So if we start by thinking about what, in fact, is the state of the ship today, we can think of WHO as one ship, or perhaps more accurately as seven ships, because, of course, we have a main office, a head office in Geneva, we have six regional offices, uh, we have six, new ca six captains in the regional uh, offices, and, in fact, on top of that, 150 more ships in the fleet. 
And so part of the job of the captain of WHO is in fact to keep that entire fleet of 157 boats afloat and moving in the same direction, which uh, as you can imagine is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily an easy thing. Um, who are the member states in relation to this ship? Well, the member states can be thought of as uh, the uh, owners of the ship. In fact, those who first built the ship, who created it, who invested in it. Um, the owners uh, don't always agree with each other. They're often uh, fighting over the direction that the ship should take. Um, the owners debate over how much money should be invested in the maintenance of the ship. Uh, the ship is now 70 years old, and some might argue that, in fact, what has been invested in maintaining this machine uh, is not quite enough and, and isn't, isn't structured properly. Um, but in addition to being the owners and the investors, the member states are also many other things in relation to, to the ship. They are captains of their own ships. And sometimes they ask WHO for uh, technical advice on how they should manage a particular problem or challenge. Sometimes uh, there's a fire in one of those ships and they ask WHO for help in putting out that fire. Sometimes they don't want the WHO ship to get in the way of where they're going. Uh, they don't want certain technical advice or advice that might um, conflict with what they perceive to be in, in their own interests. So the captain of the WHO ship has to deal with a very complex and always political relationship, of course, with, um, with its owners. Um, so what must the ship and the captain do, the, the second question. I think everybody here in the room and, and those of you online are very familiar with the long list of unprecedented health challenges we face, so I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time going through those, um, from infectious disease to non-communicable disease to attacks on health workers and conflict zones, etc. Um, but what I can conclude is that there is increasingly uh, more and more cargo being put on all ships, on all countries whose health, health systems are struggling, and certainly on WHO. The 70-year-old ship is being asked to carry more and more cargo, but it can't do it all alone. Sometimes there are a lot of ships that are crowded into a tight space like a harbor, and it's not clear how all of these different ships should be maneuvering around each other so they don't, in fact, hit each other. And part of WHO's role as the convening and the coordinating and, and directing authority in global health is, in fact, to bring together the captains of all of these different ships uh, to try to negotiate the rules of the game and make sure that everybody gets where they're going um, safely and is able to stay alive. Um, this is not always easy because, of course, WHO is not always the biggest ship in the harbor. Uh, there are many other ships that are richer, uh, bigger, nimbler, more modern, faster, uh, younger. Um, but it is, of course, a, 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 fundamental, um, a, a fundamental ship. And then sometimes a storm comes out of the blue all of a sudden, uh, and we can think, of course, about recent uh, outbreaks and, and health crises such as Ebola and MERS and Zika, and then you need the captain of this ship to be a steady hand and to be a voice of uh, authority in, in very choppy waters. Uh, finally, the question of what kinds of waters, in fact, is this WHO ship sailing in? So we are uh, in a time of unprecedented change. It's not an exaggeration to say that the waters are warming, the water levels are rising, icebergs are melting. This is, of course, all happening in the real world because of climate change. Um, but it's also a pretty decent metaphor for what's happening in the area of global health. We are transitioning away from the era of the MDGs towards a more systems-oriented approach in the era of the SDGs, which calls into question the roles of major uh, global health institutions, such as the Global Fund and UNAIDS, um, and WHO needs to chart those waters together with these other um, big ships. Uh, so to summarize quickly, I think it's useful to think of the WHO Director General as the captain of a 70-year-old ship whose owners are often fighting, uh, who don't always agree on where the ship should go, who haven't quite invested enough in maintaining that ship, uh, even while they pile more and more cargo onto it. Uh, it might be useful to think of the captain's job not just as keeping the WHO ship afloat and moving, but in fact stewarding the entire system and making sure that all ships can get safely to where they're going. And finally, uh, this ship and all other ships are now sailing in, in choppy and uncharted waters. So I've described a pretty tough, uh, big challenge. 
And of course, on top of all that, this ship has recently weathered probably one of the most difficult storms in its 70-year history, which is, of course, the Ebola outbreak. Uh, and it emerged on the other side of that outbreak, pretty battered and bruised. Um, and in my estimation, its owners have not yet fully decided whether they're going to invest in making the necessary repairs or let it uh, limp along in, in a current um, damaged state. So it's a very, very difficult job. Um, I've reached the limit of my time, and I've probably stretched this metaphor as far as I can take it. <laughs> so let me now turn the floor over to Richard Horton um, and the courageous candidates who put themselves forward, uh, one of whom will be the future captain of the ship. Welcome, everybody, to this very exciting afternoon. Um, whatever one says about WHO, it's our leading global health agency. It exists to defend, to protect, to advance the health of every single person on this planet. And that makes the election of one of these candidates, and one more, which I'll explain about in a moment, a critical moment in human history. No less important than another election that's taking place in a country slightly to the west of us. This is exciting. And it's also our opportunity to renew our optimism and our enthusiasm for the World Health Organization. Now, I have to begin with one apology. You'll notice that one candidate, Dr. Tedros, is not sitting on the stage today. And that is because he contacted us yesterday and he has had to withdraw from this event and he sends his apologies. As many of you will have followed, the situation in Ethiopia is fluid but stabilizing and you know that he is departing as foreign minister. He has had to return to Ethiopia urgently in his words to help with the time sensitive transition of a new cabinet. He has expressed his deep disappointment at not being able to join us today but after November the 11th he will be free of his domestic political responsibilities to rejoin the campaign. Now, Minister Tedros, notwithstanding, we have five wonderful candidates in front of us. Let me introduce them to you, and they are sitting in alphabetical order. And I will start here with Dr. Flavia Bustreo, representing the government of Italy. Mm -hmm. Professor Philippe Dust Blasi from the government of France. Dr. David Nabarro, representing the government of the United Kingdom. Dr. Sanya Nishtar, the government of Pakistan. And Dr. Miklos Shoshka, the government of Hungary. Now here's how we're going to use our time in this first hour. Each candidate is being given a strict three-minute opportunity to explain themselves, their manifesto, and why they should be Director General of WHO. And after that, we will go into a question and answer session. So I'm going to begin immediately with Dr. Bustreo. Three minutes, Dr. Bustreo. Why you? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a delight to be here in London, where I did study and sharpen my skills in communicable disease epidemiology. Yes. A captain of the ship. Not a gender neutral attribute, but I do feel at ease with that uh, comparison. I come from Venice. This was the town that actually sailed uh, first in the, around the world, so I do feel at ease. Mm -hmm. So why me as captain of the ship? Let me say, how do I see the waters? I see troubled waters because it's the greatest injustice that we have in the world currently, that millions of adults of children, of adolescents, they die unnecessarily, despite the fact that we have knowledge and intervention that could save their lives. A million more die unnecessarily or suffer unnecessarily from illnesses and do not reach their full potential. And million more are internally displaced, are refugees, are migrants, and do not have access to health and healthcare services. So where is the equity in the world? Where is the social justice in this world? Where is the right to health for everyone? These, I think, are critical questions and are the questions that informs the key principles that underpin my vision. You will understand in three minutes. I do not have the time to explain fully, but please remind, remember these five words, equity, 
This is at the center of the Sustainable Development Goals principles. Leave no one behind. <coughs> Rights. This, the right to health is in the constitution of the World Health Organization. But still, as I've said, we have millions of people that do not enjoy that right to health. Evidence. This is an organization that is founded on the scientific and medical evidence. And I'm so glad to be here where there are so many academics with us. Responsiveness. Yes, we need to respond to the crisis in a better way, in a more prepared way, in a more systematic way. And then finally, partnerships. Many of you know I founded, created, and really expanded a partnership for maternal, newborn, and child health. And I value the power of all the partners that are represented here. The young people, please, I'm so pleased to see many students. <coughs> the academic, the healthcare professionals, the non-governmental organization with their powers for advocacy, the private sector, and all the constituencies that now, as you described, are the, where the energy and the passion for global health is. Why me? I have three qualities. I have the character for being the captain. I have the capacity, and in the answer I will elaborate, your and three, I have the courage. Your three minutes are up, Flavio. That's it. Okay, <laughs> very good, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Professor Deuce Blasi, three minutes. Thank you, and good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. Um, at a time when uh, new health crises threaten the world, the international community, more than ever, more than ever, needs the efficiency and the authority of the WHO. <coughs> For me, the WHO has to be the organization which defines health as a political priority, not only as a technical priority. Not only because it is a human right, but because it is the best investment for the economic development of a country. So we have to explain to heads of state, we have to convince them that to improve <coughs> global health, we have to consider global health as a priority. To make this possible, we, have, we need absolute confidence between the WHO and its member states. To enhance this confidence, we have to implement the three R. R, like reform, responsiveness, results. And uh, the reform, it is one ship, not seven ships. Lin lines of accountability, clear lines of accountability between the director general, regional directors, and country officers. Reactiveness, we have to learn from the past. So we need a strong preparedness and emergency response functions, co-located as the same team. And results, we have to demonstrate consistently the efficiency of the WHO. If we fail that, the big don donors are going to reduce their donations to a critical level. And the credibility of the WHO is going to to be reduced. With that, we are going to have, the Director General has to be very proactive to have sustainable and predictable and additional. And I founded UNITAID, the first laboratory of innovative financing in 2006. Second, we have to strengthen primary healthcare system to narrow inequalities like Flavia said. And we have to integrate public health in health systems. It is the most important. And finally, we have to tackle non-communicable disease and antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Dr. David Nabarro. Thank you very much indeed. It's a delight to be here at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And in my three minutes, I'm going to talk about the international perspective. I'm going to talk about the issues that matter. And I'm going to talk about a WHO 
that innovates for the future. International affairs. The international system that provides global multilateral governance was invented 70 years ago, but has to reinvent itself now because the way in which the world operates is no longer just governments working on their own. It's many more different sectors of society engaged, business and civil society, academics, the media, regional bodies, they're all now seeking to be stakeholders. And health in particular is one in which no longer can we say the ministries of health are in charge. It actually belongs to all sections of society. And that brings me to issues. In September last year, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs for short, were agreed by world nations after three years of consultation with numerous individuals and organisations. These 17 goals will contribute to the health of everyone when they're fully implemented. They also call for health in order to actually work, particularly when it comes to gender equity or poverty reduction. So therefore, health is repositioning as part of the broad, multilateral, multi-sectoral, sustainable development agenda. Unfortunately, there are some specific threats that have got to be dealt with, be it climate change or infectious disease or toxins, together with the very particular health issues that are faced in communities and nations that vary from one to the other. And the continuing challenge of health systems, how do you deal with ageing populations? How do you ensure that all people are fully able to access health care with no one being left behind? These are complicated issues, but they're not impossible. Because thirdly, innovating for the future. That's what I'm all about. A WHO that's ready to find its place in the new international system that deals with the multifaceted issues without becoming completely overwhelmed. It means recognising that a future WHO is based around relationships, based around a redefinition of its role, and based around the development of competence and quality of working in a systems multilateral environment with multiple stakeholders, rather than a pyramidal structure that is based around governments and uh, intergovernmental organizations behaving as though they're completely in charge. What does this specifically mean? It means, that's my time up, it means having a WHO that's catalytic, convening, facilitating, and most important of all, evidence-based. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> Dr. Sanya Nishtar, three minutes. Thank you, Richard. Uh, the World Health Organization is the world's only universal membership multilateral agency in health. It has some very important mandates which are not fungible. And it has the potential and the mandate to address some of the most pressing challenges in the health and development arena that the world is, with, is faced with today, challenges such as the risk of pandemics, antimicrobial resistance, and non-communicable diseases, which threaten to wipe out the development gains of the last century. It is critical that we ensure that the current reform underway and others that are needed are brought to fruition as soon as possible so that the agency is effective. And within this context, my vision centers uh, on three things, and I make 10 pledges in support of that vision. Number one, I commit to restoring trust in WHO and ensuring that it is once again the world's, world's leading health agency that has, in which the world has its trust based. Secondly, I pledge to focus WHO squarely on its core mandates, and I outline four programmatic priorities in this regard. And thirdly, I lay emphasis on partnerships, and the, and the premise is that WHO should exercise leadership through a focus on its core mandates and by accepting the importance of comparative advantage and complementarity. Uh, why should it be me, as Richard emphasized? Number one, I bring a breadth of experience. I have served as a federal minister in a country of 200 million people charged with multi-sectoral responsibility where I left a lasting legacy. I have a background of major institutional leadership at the civil society level, both nationally and internationally. I have played technical 
and political leadership roles in the multilateral system, and I have hands-on practical experience of developing institutions from nothing in resource-constrained and very difficult environments and taking them to scale. I'm a doctor and a researcher by, by training, uh, and my background is very relevant to the new asks within the Sustainable Development Goals. I bring to the table a combination of attributes which are critical for leading an organization, WHO, at this point in time. I have an unwavering commitment to transparency, and it is evidenced in my campaign because I have pledged to make my electoral campaign financing public to the last detail. I have a demonstrated commitment to accountability. I have... Um, I set precedent as a federal minister by putting out all my decisions in the public domain and using it as a lever for accountability. I have respect for independent institutional arrangements and I have the capacity to speak truth to power, as was evidenced by my decision to step down from my role as chair of the independent accountability panel for reasons that I'm sure to, for, to avoid perception of conflict of interest. I have- Thank you, Tony. That's your Thank you very much. Dr. Miklos Shoshka, three minutes, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you know, when I was uh, facing the question that I should talk about uh, my experiences and the, and, and the way I see the challenges WHO has faces, uh, my plans for the organization, my vision about the organization, I thought it is like asking you the question to, to have a short introduction to Brexit in three minutes. <laughs> so, I'm, so I think, so I think, uh, but I try, but I, but I try hard. You know, I, I selected four simple words for my campaign slogan. Better health, stronger WHO. This is simple but interconnected. You know, I'm 100% sure that we can only achieve better health if we have a strong, agile change agent for health globally. And you know, I'm 100% sure that we can only achieve that and we can only can generate resources uh, if, we perf if we perform better uh, on the fight for health. Uh, and that's, that's the better health and, uh, and stronger WHO slogans meaning. And you know, uh, uh, building on the sailing, uh, sailing uh, metaphor, I think uh, I would be uh, a captain with my experiences in managing sustainable change as Minister of State for Health as an, or as an academic. I think uh, I have to say to the, uh, to the colleagues and the health policy community, hey, stop for a second. I think we missed the direction. We are, we are in a rocky water. Uh, there, is a, there is a storm coming. So we have to prepare for that and we have to sail the ship to more, uh, more, uh, more easy water, that there is more fish. Uh, over there, uh, there, there are new territories that we can, that we can conquer for health. And you know, it is, so I'm, I'm that change agent type captain coming on the, or boarding the ship. And you know, the, uh, I shouldn't go into details. We will have time for, uh, for bringing in our experiences to questions, but I, but I should bring some of the, some of the aspects I, I found uh, important. You know, the agility fighting disease uh, needs not just organization to pandemics, but also clever behavior insights uh, to, to fight the, the biggest killers, the non-communicable non diseases. And when we are talking about SDGs or universal health coverage, there is money, very sustainable money, which is not just temporary donation, uh, but uh, which is generated through innovative, uh, innovative tools, and they are funding health sustainably and funding universal health coverage sustainably. So we have to change the focus of debate to financial and political decision makers with an agile, performance-oriented, action-oriented organization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.